strike of a light pole. I just air it out and leave with the mic broke. Your micro, I'm hard body like Tyco. Heavy metal Chevys with nitro. Addicted to the vapors of paper. Hypnotic to the thirst. I'm pulling off criminal capers. I know the cocaine crackery stinks, but that's what it is. Surrounded by the khakis and mints. We move. There's the ventilation shaft. We must split up here. Yeah. Well, I guess it's time to put on the Tira guys and go meet my new pals. Good luck. I will assist you if I can. <laughs> oh shit, the Tira guys. Ah, uh, the Tira guys. <laughs> oh man, uh, I designed the gadget. Uh, and uh, Tony, this gadget, but not this segment of the gadget, was when we had our famous fight. Well, famous to you. Again, I don't recall it in the least. <laughs> uh, you... Hey, wait. Clank traversal. Yep. it's uh, It splits between Clank and Ratchet, and then Ratchet uses the tier guys. Did you do this Clank segment as well? I, or... I did, yeah. Uh, so, this, is, this was our first bit of Clank gameplay. So, let's talk really quick about Clank, Clank gameplay, because we discussed this on the last one. And it's always interesting to see where how Clank gameplay ends up. Uh, I imagine you had a mandate to make it different from the last one, Ugh. but also keep the things that worked. What was the mandate going into this game for what Clank gameplay was going to be? So we knew that uh, we knew that we were going to have Secret Agent Clank on this game. So in this segment, I had to set up some of the stuff that Secret Agent Clank would do later on. So that was one mandate. Another one is, uh, we love the Gadgetbots, but every designer who has ever worked on a Clank segment has always been a little sad that uh, that, that sort of uh, gameplay isn't really very interactive. Like, it, it, uh, it, it pretends to be interactive, right? Like, you can really only select the things that the Gadgetbots can do when you're near a thing that they can do it on. So... The, the gameplay essentially devolves into get near the thing you're supposed to use and then use, you know, press the gadget bot button. And uh, we weren't happy with that, so this time we decided to uh, involve Scrunch, the monkey. Uh, which was basically like, uh, you know, Clank had this banana cannon and Scrunch would, would uh, you know, press buttons and stuff for him. Now, how many, if you had to count how many lewd jokes were made about the banana cannon. <laughs> over the course of development. I think... What, what would your estimate be? Uh, the, maybe a billion. And uh, <laughs> and I think also all of them were made by Carl Grande. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> our, uh, I think he was QA manager at that point, right? Or was he... Had he moved into production? Uh, I'm not sure. It's I think he was tell. QA manager still. I think Doug was coming in at the same time, but I think Carl was still QA. Oh crap! How do I... So you also did the the tier guys, which we're about to get into as well. You're like you're all over this level. Now. Oh man, you're all, you're all over the place here. Yeah, this level is uh, is me, me, and me. So why don't you tell us what the original intent was for the tier guys, and then again roll into what it actually turned out to be. So it's actually fairly. Uh, uh, it ended up fairly close to what the original pitch was, which was a uh, a, a rhythm game. Right, we were trying to uh, Guitar Hero. I don't think had come out yet. Uh, but we were we, we really liked Space Channel 5. Uh, so we wanted to get something that felt kind of like those silly moments from Space Channel 5 where you did a little dance and then something would follow you. Um, but we needed to theme it, you know, like the uh, like Atira guys. So we were like, we'll do these little rhythm puzzles and, uh, you know, we'll fiction it as you are talking to another Tyranoid. And uh, it worked pretty well, except that like, it was really, really difficult to get players to understand what we were asking them to do with this uh, interface. Uh, I, re mm. I remember we had one test where, uh, and I can probably illustrate this better the next time I get to a Tyranoid, but uh, basically, the, the guy was, you know, he, he ran up to this force field, talked to the Tyranoid, and then what he would do is he would hit the talk button, and then this would come across the screen, and he would fail. And then he would sort of look at the screen and go, okay, start it over, and fail. And he just kept doing this over and over and over again for about 15 minutes. 
And then finally, Ken had to walk over to him and say, uh, you have to play when this is happening. You have to actually interact with the controller. <laughs> and, and the kid went, oh, and then beat it on the very next try. It was, uh, it was, it was a learning experience for all of us as to how difficult it is to actually get people to understand this kind of really abstract gameplay. Uh, I don't know if that answers your question, but... Well, so I remember there was actually a lot of pushback in terms of how the hell we were going to do the UI for this sort of thing. Right. And I remember that being a lot of uh, back and forth, trying to figure out exactly how that was going to work and how we were supposed to convey it to the player. And it, it just seemed like there was a point in time where we were unsure if the rhythm game mechanic was even going to work. Yeah, I think uh, I think we were we were very close to having to pull back on it, but... I think in the end, it, it worked well enough, you know, and we had enough help messages in there that people were able to understand what they had to do. Uh, my, my favorite thing about these, uh, I actually wrote this flavor text up here. My favorite thing about this is how eloquent the tyranoids are. Uh, like, <laughs> I wrote a number of these, and then Brad, who was the writer, rewrote them so that they, they didn't suck, you know? But uh, the... I really liked that it. it was like, excuse me, sir, I wish to pass. Oh, you need you need to know the passcode. Sir, you impugn my honor. I am not a lombax. You know, like it was <laughs> it was just uh it's just sort of silly madness, and I think uh, I think that worked out pretty well. Uh, another mandate with this was torturing the monkey. Uh, which I think is That was actually a mandate. Yes. That was uh, it was like spending time torturing Scrunch is it was desirable right like everybody kind of likes it when like a cute little animal can be on fire i i don't know exactly why but that was the i don't think everybody likes that <laughs> that was the i uh, think that was the premise right is the more ways we can we can hurt or burn scrunch uh the better everything was going to be uh this hallway so uh this hallway was a huge problem for us so if you're looking straight down this hallway you won't notice that to the right there there's a, a corridor to go down. So almost every player would come straight up to this thing, get hit by it, and die. <laughs> uh, and uh, I don't know why we didn't think of putting like a bolt trail going down here, but you know that probably would have solved it. So really quick, I just want to get back to the HUD for a moment. Was this the game where we convinced Ricardo that he destroyed PlayStation 2s? <laughs> No, 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 that was the previous one. Because you it? guys were telling that legend by the time I started. Okay. Was it that? Oh. <laughs> do you, uh, do you want to wanna tell him? Uh, I, yeah, I think you know the story a little bit better than I do. Because you were actually in the test so when we, it was happening. Yeah, we went to a... Uh, we, we were running a user test. And uh, uh, we had two PlayStations just crash. And... Uh, uh, after they crashed, they had bricked. Like, they were completely useless. They didn't function as PlayStation 2s anymore. We had to send them back to Sony. And uh, both times they crashed, uh, the, the player who was playing was in the HUD. So uh, I went up to Ricardo and jokingly said, Hey, Ricardo, your HUD is bricking PlayStation 2s. Like, this isn't okay. You got to fix this. <laughs> and he thought I was being serious. So he spent the rest of the day trying to figure out why his his guys could be bricking PlayStation 2s. <laughs> and he came up to me, and I, I spent the whole day watching the focus test, so I didn't know that he, he had gone through his entire day knowing thinking this. And he came up to me and he said, Mike, I've been looking all day, and I just can't figure out why it, this would be happening. This doesn't make any sense. And I was like, Ricardo, nobody actually thinks that you did this. <laughs> I was just joking. And he got so... <laughs> mad and he just he was, <laughs> he was so deflated and sad and it was uh it was at the same time very funny and very sad <laughs> it does remind me of another hardware issue that we had during the development of this game um and this was a story that with tony it was really late at night and uh we gotten these new controllers in these like wireless controllers that we were really excited about and we're like oh this is really cool and tony was just working on some stuff and he had this really weird bug that whenever you fired the shock rifle, Ratchet would do a backflip. And we just spent ages and ages um, just like trying to debug, like trying to track the input, seeing like how are we getting these weird messages, so on and so forth. 
And I think it took Tony about four or five hours to realize that these controllers were just basically defective. <laughs> yeah. um, and would just push random shit when you didn't press it at all and so on and so forth. Um, but I remember that being about four hours of Tony's night. Just like, how can there be a bug that firing causes you to jump? It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Tony, do you remember that? I remember it vaguely. Just, we had a lot, like, third, I don't want to slag off third-party controllers, but third-party controllers are shit. They, they're pretty shit. I mean, yeah. And so we, I, I, yeah, it was just some random manufacturer. I don't even remember who sent them to us. We just had them. And they had, like, these big battery packs and shit, too, or something. Like, they were crazy. Oh, God, this is fucking awful. Like, like you suck at this really bad. Uh... Yes. Now, Tony, uh, I don't want to make you feel bad or anything, but, you know, I, I did sort of sprain my thumb and I have to play with my index finger. So oh, I see. I'd like to see how well you could play, asshole, with, uh, with a broken finger. Well, if only I, if I only had the opportunity, I'm sure I could do incredibly well. You'd probably do better than <laughs> me. Uh, you are a pro at this, so. This is a long level. We have a lot going on here. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I didn't mention it when it happened, but this actually, all this section is in a separate game level like we we mask the transition but there's so much content here we actually had to break it off into two separate levels oh wow really yeah the the submarine transition is just basically a variation on the uh on the the flying ship transitions interesting so al had to you know somehow pack that into memory have we talked about al uh i think we've only mentioned him in passing uh, let's, let's, let's talk about Al, because Al is kind of a force of nature when you work at Insomniac. Yeah, it's hard to talk about Al, though, because there's no, there's very few, like, Al doesn't have a lot of weird personality quirks besides the one, which is being Al. Uh, so Al is, is probably one of the top five engine programmers in the industry, uh, as far as I'm concerned, let's say, uh, and, uh. And I think it's because he can communicate telepathically with computers. <laughs> uh, because one time, so I, I was doing some coding on this game, uh, which most designers didn't do, right? And I ran into this problem that, uh, you know, I called Tony over and I'm like, Tony, this is crashing and I don't know why. And Tony said, oh, it's crashing because something's wrong with the engine. And so uh, uh, I called Al over and I went to go get a soda while Al was fixing the problem on my machine. And it maybe took me about a minute and a half to get the soda. And by the time I came back, there were 40 code files open on my computer. All of them were checked in and Al was gone. Uh, and I booted it up and it just worked. And what Al had done was he had just fixed the problem without even like compiling the code. <laughs> he had just fixed it, checked it in. He knew it was all good. And you know, it, by somehow mind melding with the PS2, I don't know what he did. Yeah, Al was definitely sort of a force of nature. Um, the, the main thing he, he, he was always the solution to was memory problems. Whenever we were out of memory, it was you go crying to Al, and he would sit there, you know, silently for, you know, about a minute. And then he would say, okay. And he just sort of know that it was going to be solved. <laughs> yeah, it was never in question, really. It was like, okay, Al's on it, it's good. <laughs> there was the, my favorite Al story is not even one that I experience is only one that i've heard second hand uh from roberto and he was talking about there was this meeting with sony great and in the room like in the conference room in insomniac it was uh ted al brian and a bunch of sony executives and they were all just sitting there in the conference room in silence and and roberto just walked by and sees all these people just sitting in the conference room not speaking to each other and so he walks in and is just like, hey, what's up? And they're like, shh, Al's thinking. <laughs> <laughs> so they were all just sitting there waiting for Al to think through his problem and didn't want to disturb him. Just like six or seven people just sitting there quietly. So I... that's, just, that's just sort of what it was working with him. Oh, but look who's here. That's right. <laughs> uh, yeah, we did. We did miss the plumber in the last game, didn't we, Tony? 
We did. We did not go and find the plumber. You know what? I'm going to say if we can get to 300 subscribers, we'll, we'll go back and, and do that as a bonus episode. How's that sound? Tony? I think we can do that. Yeah? Yeah, All I'm right. sorry. I, I know you're. I, was, I know you're eating your pizza, and you think yeah, that's more important. That's, ex that's exactly what was going on. Than what we're I doing. Figured here. I could sneak a bike, but somebody had to talk to me. You know what? Fuck you, Moo. Uh, I'm just gonna talk to you from now on because you're not just gonna awesome. ignore me. Uh, <laughs> I have why no do, pizza. Why don't you talk about how terrible a segment this is, and whoever did this? Oh man, needs to be ashamed. So, uh, on the last game, we had the the crystal mining, right? Right. Uh, and so it was. It was a relatively successful part of our meta game. Was uh, you know you you can go back, you can mine for crystals, you can gain experience. It's like a like a way of reusing content without having to force the player to replay the same thing over and over again, sort of. Uh, so on this game, we thought let's do the same thing, but use fewer resources. <laughs> So uh, we're like, okay, we're going to make a bunch of twisty caverns all alike that the player can totally get lost in and then uh, fill it with a whole bunch of copies of the same enemy and this will be fun, right? And uh, and then I, I was given the initial task of designing it, but uh, uh, you know, after I very, very quickly realized that this was you know, uh, going to be a huge problem, passed it off to poor Paul. Uh, so Paul actually did all the design of these things. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, I think he had to set up something like a hundred or two hundred enemy setups, none of which could be exactly the same. And, uh, oh, the poor guy. Uh, I think by the, by like his third week trying to set all this stuff up, you could watch him slowly going insane. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? Now he's working at Blizzard, so he's probably happy. Yeah, I just, one of the things is about this that was so irritating was we had enemies on magnet boots in the last game like that was something that we had already done but in the last game whenever you would hit them they would just fall to their death so we were able to cheat a lot of that kind of stuff and there was no real combat on any magnet boot surfaces but for this game there's no place for them to fall to their death so they just, they have to do all their knockback reactions and all that sort of crap that you have to do when you hit an enemy with a weapon. And that is fucking horrifying, doing all that sort of stuff. There's so much work involved in all that. And it was just a nightmare to try to get everything working and to get all the bugs hammered out in these sections. So is it... Is, there were just so many. Is it safe to say that our attempt to save uh, artists and programmers' work probably did not really save that much work in the end? <laughs> it might have saved some artists' work. It certainly didn't save any programmer work, this, this section. Just because there was a lot going on and there was a lot of really complicated problems. Uh, in terms of what we were going to do here. So I'm not going to do too much more of this. I'm going to... Uh, uh, you know, just get some sewer crystals so we can buy another weapon. But uh, the oh, wait, you, we don't even have to do this. No, I don't think this is mandatory. Then why are we here at all? Uh, Let's just get moving. Okay, all right. I'll, I'll see if I can find out how to get back. Um, so you know that uh, uh, that swimming section, the force scroll swimming section we were in. Yeah. Uh, the reason it's there is because there's a, a one straightaway in this entire thing. And if you go down it, you can jump back into that current. And that was basically how we prevented people from getting lost. Is if you could find that one place, you could jump into the current and get back to the beginning of the level. Gotcha. So that was our shortcut. Is that current any easier to find than the actual beginning of the level, though? Uh, it, it is, yeah. Uh, I just uh, am having trouble <laughs> finding either <laughs> of them right now. Uh, it uh, Once you... Especially once you get on the second floor of this building, uh, you know, it, like you, you get the gravity boots and you run up and, and get up the second floor, it, it finding the current ends up being a little bit easier. There we go. All right, let's talk to Mr. Plumber. So uh, I remember originally it, it wasn't going to be crystals, but Brian Algeyer really loves crystals for, for some reason. <laughs> uh, so we it, it was already a sewer because we had the pipes. So Brian Algar said, "Oh well, why don't they be sewer crystals?" And immediately everyone was like, "So it's poop, right?" <laughs> and, and he's like, "No, it's not poop. It's sewer crystals." And 
there was a big thing, and then eventually uh, Brad, the writer, just wrote in the, the poop joke, and it got, it got sealed forever. Uh, so I, I think we're done with this level. I, I think we're ready to move on. I think finally, yeah, we're done with this level. So uh, do you want to sign off, Tony, since I seem to be incapable of doing so? Yeah, so for Ratchet and Clank, up your Arsenal developer commentary, I am Tony Garcia. And I'm Mike Stout, and our guest is... Moo you. And, uh, Tony? We will see you next time. Dude, there was a lot in that level. <laughs>